Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 69, Thanks Gaming AMA. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, so last Wednesday in November and the day before Turkey Day in the U.S. So first off, I want to wish all of our American listeners a happy Thanksgiving. Being the last Wednesday of the month, this also means it's time for another live Q&A. Tonight, we're back answering your questions live once again. In addition to the AMA, during the Ask the Bellhop segment of the show, uh, we've also got a review of King of the Dice from Haba after that, and I've gotten quite a few more plays of Cthulhu, Death May Die, that I'll be talking about in the On the Table segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, so if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. So up first, a couple comments about our horrified review. That is the hot cooperative game from Ravensburger featuring the Universal Studios monsters. Jason Olson writes, Love this game. Easy to learn, easy to teach, and fun to play. I'm currently painting the minis. If anyone is interested for some novice video on these, drop on by and let me know what you think. I'll be painting the bride next. Jason can be found on YouTube at Pips and Chits, P-I-P-S and Chits with hyphens in between on YouTube. And uh, just dropping a link in the chat room. Thanks, Jason. We'll definitely drop a link to your channel in our show notes as well. Now, Tommy Brownell writes, great review. I need to pick this up sometime. Thanks, Tommy. Well, if anyone's interested in picking up Horrified at all, right now is the time to do it. It's at an all-time low price on Amazon at under 27 bucks. It's a really great game. I got to say, even though it's a good price right now, it's worth paying full price for this one. I wouldn't complain paying any, well, I wouldn't want to pay more than MS, MSRP, but this is one that I think is fully worth the cost. Up next, a comment about last week's topic, and that was tips for becoming a solid game master. Ryan Toxopius writes, great advice. I've been playing D&D 5e for over a year now, and I don't know all the rules, as my players will tell you. For instance, when the Barbarian decided to wrestle a merchant for a diamond on their mules, talk about uninspected things players do, I had to look up unarmed damage for non-monks, because I got confused because improvised weapons are 1d4 plus strength, but fists are just 1 plus strength, plus rage in this case. I'm so, so glad I decided to record these sessions and share them as a podcast because I somehow landed 10 excellent players and both groups have been a dream to play with. And yet, I flat out make mistakes too. Got Torm and Helm confused in the last game and added a note to the YouTube video when it comes up. It happens. You move on. As long as everyone's having fun, that's what really matters. Well, thanks, Ryan. Now, up next, Gordon... Uh... Hushner commented on our Cthulhu Death May Die review on YouTube. They wrote, great review, thanks for sharing. I'm personally glad it's not a campaign. Glad they don't link up. I'm a gamer who doesn't have time for a campaign, so I like one-shot adventures like this one. And in the games I have been playing, the cultists and wound markers, it's not really an issue. They die so quickly that it almost doesn't matter. But agreed, it is cramped on that board. Well, thanks for the comment, Gordon. I, I gotta admit, I do, I get it. I get the appeal of a game you can just sit down and play with whoever's there and whoever's interested at the time. Not having to worry about who's played what before, how far along you are in the scenario or anything like that, or needing the same group, I get it. I just think it would have been cool if they'd included both methods to play. Like, for example, Arcadia Quest does that. You can play it single or you can play campaign mode. Now, having played the game a few more times, more about that in a later segment, I found it even more odd that the individual scenarios aren't linked either, which I didn't realize at first. Like they call it season one, 
And it's got different episodes, but the episodes aren't linked in any way. Like, why use this episodic format if the game's not going to be have any type of overall arc? I find that strange. Yeah, I can definitely see both sides on this one. The product theming and overall feel of the game really does lend itself to being a campaign. But then again, a series of one-offs does make sense since you aren't expected to survive an encounter with an old one or see kill the same old one more than once. Although in this case, you're going to kill the same old one many, many times. Indeed. You do have choices. The other thing, too, is the expansion doesn't come with any more old ones. Season two, no more old ones than that. Looking at that in the store. So you're going to be fighting an awful lot of Cthulhu and Haster. You can, you can buy additional old ones, though. Yeah, there are other yeah. ones available. All right, one final comment. This is on an older post that I recently reshared, which is discussing getting your kids into gaming and the best games for kids. It coming up on the holidays, I thought it was something people will dig, and feedback on it's been positive. Gene Chu writes, I recently picked up my first Castle Panic, anticipation of my nephew visiting next month. I chose a co-op game because the last time we played a game, he seemed to not like games where one person wins. We changed the rules not to bother keeping score. You know, thanks for the comment, Gene. I know my kids tend to be the same way. They just don't like competing with family members. Uh, they're happy to compete against friends, but they'd rather work with other family members when it comes to games. Now that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on yep. Twitch. And we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell. Uh, since today's show is all about answering your questions live, we aren't going to spend a lot of time here now, as we'll be right back in the next segment. But we, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, yeah, I'm fixing the window again. Uh, every scene again. <laughs> all right. <what? laughs> all righty. So we'll be back checking the lobby a few more times during the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the website and head to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to come through is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It's the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for us to answer your gaming and game night questions live. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all to Thanks Gaming. Today is Thanksgiving Eve in some parts of the world, and if you are celebrating that holiday, I do wish you a happy one. I indeed, happy holidays to everyone as we enter into this season filled with something for just about every religion, non-religion out there. Whatever you choose to celebrate, be safe and be kind. Yep. All right, so do we have any questions from the lobby besides what coffees are you drinking so far? That is the one I saw so far. So I am drinking a Muskoka wolf head. It's a, It's got a picture of a wolf on the cup. Uh, it's a medium dark. It's decent coffee. It's all right. It's it's coffee coffee. Nothing fancy, nothing, nothing flavored. It's, it's drinkable. It's good. It's not great. Uh, while I am drinking a Friendly's uh, Caramel Swirl, uh, that uh, is, is nice. I'm not a, I'm not a caramel fan, but uh, I'm I'm enjoying it, and it smelled great brewing it. So uh, there is that. Uh, now we do have a comment earlier from Twitter. Kenny Crum at Kenyon Crum asked, "Do you have a recommendation for a party game to take to Thanksgiving for people that don't normally play board games? My go-to is usually Cash and Guns, and no thanks." All right, we've covered. Uh, games that are good for experienced gamers when playing with non -game or, or non-experienced gamers. And we talked about light games to bring out. So this is going to overlap a couple of things we talked about previously. Uh, in this case, what you're looking for are games that, especially at a holiday party, I wouldn't worry about the gamer games at all. In this case, I think you're trying to get people to game. You're getting people to play together and to enjoy a good time and to socialize. So you're gonna want games where you can do that. You can socialize, you can talk, you can hang out, you can probably have some drinks, maybe some food and play at the same time. So not everyone's just focused on the game. So in, in my opinion in general, unless you really wanna try to sell it, leave the gamer games at home in this case and stick to mainly the party games. Cash and Guns is one, I don't know about that one. Uh, that, that depends on your family. Maybe that's an American thing, but a bunch of people pointing phone guns at each other wouldn't go over well at any of my family parties. But No Thanks is a great suggestion. That's a good um, 
pass the buck style game where you're playing cards really quick to teach. Uh, one of the go-to ones, you know what, I'll start off with games I've actually introduced to my family or my extended family. One of the first that was a huge hit with our family was the Great Del Moody. Uh, this is from, I'm drawing a blank on his name, the guy who made Magic the Gathering, Richard Garfield. Uh, actually, a game I think he wrote before it was originally published by Woods of the Coast. I don't know if they still publish it now. Um, we actually got it at that giant mall that's over in Detroit when it first opened up. Or not in Detroit, the Mall of America or whatever, that huge mall. Uh, this is a version of President or that other word that we don't say because we're a family show, um, where you are playing tricks of cards and you have to play the same number of cards as the person before you and a lower number beats it. So if I play four, four, or sorry, that's a bad example. If I play four 13s, the next player could play four nines and the next player could play four fives. And then the only thing that's going to beat that is someone who plays four fours. And at the end of every round, the last, you're trying to play all the cards in your hand. And when you're done, you actually rearrange your seating. And that's where the fun comes in, is you have the Great Del Moody, a lesser Del Moody. You have a lesser peon and a greater peon. And the roles those have, and the, all the other players are merchants and have some little special trading rules. And after every round, everyone gets up and moves around. So the Great Del Moody gets, like, the head of the table. Uh, we used to play with silly hats that people wore as well. It's It, it was a lot of fun. Plus, it's just a really basic tricky game. If you're playing with people who play card games, right, who know tricks and no trump and stuff like that they're all good all right um my my family doesn't game much on uh on, <laughs> no. on holidays so uh i can't i can't offer much into this one all um, right other ones that have worked good for us then um concept has been really good uh that that worked well but that took later in the night like once people have already kind of I already met up with everyone they haven't talked to in a long time and had their big conversation and are now kind of looking for something to do because I found during concept, this is a game where you're probably not going to chat a lot during play. You're going to be focused on the board yelling out answers or you're going to be the person giving the clues. So that is one you're going to focus. Uh, one surprising it fell completely flat with my family was uh, code names. Code names did not work. I refused to bring that out again. I brought that out on Christmas Eve one night or not Christmas Eve, a good Christmas party with my mom's family. And I, wow, that that was too complicated for my family. They just could not get concept, didn't understand why you would give more than one clue, did not like it at all. Oh, concept or code names? Code names, sorry, code names. Okay. Code names. Concept went over great. Code names, terrible, flat, absolutely horrible. Um, any of the, your, like really, your, your telestrations would be great. Plays up to 12 people. You need the 12 people party pack. You need the big set. Dexterity games are extremely popular. The problem is they usually don't play big groups. But if you're playing ones that are quick enough, you can just kind of rotate through the different groups or have multiple tables going. Like, this is why Jenga is often popular, right? Like, and I, there's nothing wrong with Jenga. I personally would bring out Hamster Roll or Go Cuckoo or something like that. Again, light, easy to teach, um, no real pre planning, strategizing, no AP. Just take your turn, do your thing. More activities than games. Solid plans. All right, so we got a first chat, uh, question from the chat room. Poncho72 asks, do you guys plow through a rule, rule book to learn a game or watch a video or a combo of both? I'm a rule book person, 100%. To me, that's part of the, I like reading rule books. I actually enjoy reading rule books. I think it goes back to my RPG days. I've read way more role-playing games than I'll ever run or play because I just enjoy reading them to see how each author does things differently and how the mechanics are handled different. And that spills over to board games. Like, I, I'm actually excited to read the rules for a game to see, hey, how's this going to handle it? How's this game going to do deck building? How's this game going to handle that? So I actually really like reading rule books. I also find I absorb better from rule books. Um, I'm guessing that's probably just part of my age, right? Like, I grew up having to study. I went to university. I read a lot of textbooks. I know how to annotate. Like, it's just how I learned was that way. References, reading references, not watching stuff on the Internet. So that's what I'm used to. Now, what I do is I often read a rule book for a game like when I get it. That's part of me. It's part of the excitement. Well, now we tend to unbox them first. So soon after I've unboxed the game, means I'm probably sitting on the couch or at a coffee shop reading rule books. But then I don't play the game right away. So it usually takes a couple weeks before I can actually get the game out to an event or uh, even just my Monday night game group. That's where I'll usually watch a video just to refresh my memory on what I read. Plus, every now and then there's something that's not clear in a rule book that'll be more clear in a video. So initially plow through the rule book, literally cover to cover. I don't even like picking ahead. Like I know people when they read role playing rule books will like skip to the DM session or skip to the spell session. I literally will start on page one and read to page 399, one in a row. 
And that's why a lot of rule books, I die out in the skill section because I get bored of reading all the different skills and how everyone handles. How, how far can you jump this time? Is it your heart, height times 1.5 or is it an abstract number? Is it based on your strength? Like I'll die out at that point, but it's always plow through. And then as a refresher, I'll watch a video. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big rule book fan. Absolutely. Uh, whenever possible, I'll read the rule book. The only time I defer from that is I find a lot of the board game arena pieces because you don't have the game in front of you and you don't have the pieces to interact with. Uh, that's where I find the videos make a huge difference because mm -hmm. if I've got a board game and I can pick up a piece and I can look at it and if they refer to something in a board game, you can actually see and feel those things. That board that that manual makes a whole lot or that uh, makes a whole lot of sense instruction booklet. Whereas on board game arena, because you don't have any way to really interact with the pieces or the board or the setup, uh, you're relying so much on the computer, I find then watching the videos and watching someone actually set it up and, and you know, living vicariously through their setup uh, yeah. makes a huge difference in my ability to play games better on Board Game Arena. I wonder with the videos, if I do it less, I used to always play, not play solo, but set the game up. So I would read the rule book and then I would go downstairs to my gaming room and set the game up and touch all the pieces. I find I don't do that as much now. So I'm, I'm wondering if it's because I've, I've now had the videos to watch to do that. But like role playing games, too, that was something else I did. Before I ever ran any role playing game, I would sit down and make a character myself. And I always found I learned way more trying to make that character than I did just reading the book or trying to run it. Because once you start making a character, that's when you realize just what you have to reference, that I need to jump back to page 70 to find these rules, and I need to jump here, and then I need to look at the looks list of feats. Board games aren't usually complicated enough for that. Fair enough. Uh, now, uh, Ryan asks, uh, are there any terrible rule books you want to call out? Uh, Shafosa. That still will, will always be. If you read my review on Shafosa, I complain about it a lot. Shafosa was terrible, though I did play that. There was one worse. Um, there was a miniature company out of France called Rackham, and they made a game called Confrontation. And at the time, they were the most beautiful miniatures I have ever seen in my entire life. Like, they they were slightly larger scale. They were one of the first companies to use 32 millimeter instead of 30, which was the game's workshop scale, or 28, which was the old D&D &D scale. So they were bigger, so they had more detail. Um, they were one of the first companies to use resin, but these were metal, the ones I had, just amazing miniatures. And they got some of the best painters in the world to paint them. And back when Cool Mini or Not was a miniature company and not a board game company, uh, I saw these and they blew me away. Well, they put out a board game called Nemesis. And I gotta admit, it was pretty close to a knockoff of, of um, Space Hulk, as you could get. Uh, it was a board, used D6s, you were using miniatures on the board, two-player only, spawn points. It really did seemed like they're they're really going for that games workshop feel but being a company from france i don't know who did their translate but i honestly think it might have been google like it might have been Babelfish back in that day so it was really bad like so bad that i could not figure out how to play and to be honest now i could probably look it up and maybe someone has an actual play video but when that game came out this is a few years back the internet was around but it wasn't you didn't have board game geek or I didn't know Board Game Geek existed, whatever that happens to be. So I couldn't figure out how to play it. I literally gave up, which wasn't bad because the miniatures were amazing. So I kind of bought the game mainly for the miniatures, but it would have been nice to at least try the game. It's one I should probably Google at this point because I, I basically forgot about it. It's one that should probably be in our pile of shame count because I do technically still own it. All right, so... Uh, here we go. Uh, Black Friday, crazy shopping time. You have yep. a $10 price limit, a price limit for a secret Santa gift exchange. What game do you buy? Hmm. I'm trying to think of what's 10 bucks. Would have been Dixit yesterday. <laughs> well, it's it's okay. definitely tougher in Canada than it is in the States. I'm yeah, sure. that, that was in the U S it was, it was, yeah. it was nine 99 yesterday. It was crazy. Nine 99 all day yesterday for some reason for Dixit. Ah, uh, with 10 bucks. So, I bought for a seat. It depends who I'm exchanging with. So I have bought now twice Racco for a secret Santa gift exchange with non gamers because that's, it's a decent enough game. It's not overly complicated. It's a, I don't know if anyone knows Racco, but it's, you get it. You have a rack full of numbered cards and you have to try to put them in order. 
and when you you always throw away a card and get a new card and you have to put the new card so it's numeric and the first person to get their entire rack in numeric order wins it's it's old it's like possibly even earlier than 60s it's at least 70s game it was a game my parents taught me to play that we had as a kid that was my go-to because like everyone already had uno so i wouldn't grab uno um another one that i hear is fantastic and only cost 10 bucks is monopoly deal i would probably buy that blind based on the number of people who have told me that's amazing um actually that was one that was the one i tried to get during the july amazon sale i tried to buy it because they had it on for five bucks and amazon was so badly broken by by volume or whatever i could not check out and yeah, I ended up not buying it. I have heard it's good. I've heard Monopoly Deal is actually really good. Uh, love Letter. I, I don't really like Love Letter, but it's in that right. But the um, Empire Engine, if you can find it, that was an AEG game in a little bag. Uh, again, I think that was MSRP 15, though, not 10. 10's, 10's tight. Yeah, 10 is very tight these days. 10 is very tight. Nowadays, nowadays I think most uh, Secret Santas are aiming more for the $20 range, I think, just because it gives you so much more flexibility yeah. than uh, trying to fit something into that ten dollar this is off the top of my head if you give me google for a minute and i go on amazon i'm sure i could find some better suggestions but off the top of my head ah yeah i said monopoly deal is the one i keep hearing a lot of p and it, it has been that cheap again i don't think the msrp is that low right now redmi uh, ryan's talking about news at 11 is uh half off at boardgamebliss.com i have to say you know i've been i've been keeping an eye on board game bliss because i've been hearing so many great things about their prices but they don't keep a lot of stock. Oh. And, and that is, is really kind of the downfall I'm, I'm struggling with on, uh, on, on going to Board Game Bliss because every time I've gone there, because there's a number of games that I'm, I'm sort of entertaining looking at, at picking up for mm -hmm. the kids for Christmas. And so I'm going to Board Game Bliss because I know they've got some great prices and you know I'm keeping an eye on, on the new uh, Canadian deals page. Uh, but every time I go there, I, I look at, you know, hey, l let's just search up all the Harry Potter games. And they have like one of them in stock. Yeah. And that's that's problematic. So Board Game Bliss this is a shout out to them. Bosco at Board Game Bliss did sponsor us for Extra Life, mm -hmm. provided us with two gift cards to give away. And one of the people who won the gift card still hasn't used it. So Bosco actually wrote yesterday and asked, is there something wrong? And well, they're trying to get a game. They're trying to get Monster Factory because right. Stacy was there with her granddaughter playing it at Extra Life and loved it. And it's got a really good price, but it just it's still not in stock. Yeah. So I don't know if like they, they need to clear their page more often. If it make maybe they have more coming. I don't know. I personally have bought off them once over all the years. Um, my favorite online retailer in Canada for a long time was GermanGames.ca, which is now GreatBoardGames.ca. That's where I got a lot of my stuff, but for them, it was mainly because they had a very reasonable free shipping amount. So they worked out cheaper than Amazon most of the time. Yeah, no, it's 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 been unfortunate. But, uh, you know, again, they do have great prices, and I do like to support Can uh, Canada and buy Canadian yeah. when I can, if, if, they're, if it's reasonable. So. Oh, I get it. Like, uh, we are both Canadian. I'll admit, most of my shopping is done on Amazon.com. But I live in a border city, so it's easy for me to get, well, easy, quote unquote, for me to get stuff shipped to the U.S. and get it over here to Windsor. But I, to be honest, I can't support Amazon.ca because their prices are terrible compared to .com. It is. You'd have to, I mean, there, the amount of time you need to spend shopping on Amazon.com to find any deals on anything, uh, games especially not, but on yeah. anything, really. Now, what has been getting better is Indigo. Indigo.ca has been really good lately uh, for games, but wait for sales. They yeah. they have sales. And the other thing is don't trust their MSRP. I don't know where they're yeah, pulling they're... their prices out of, but it's not where it should be coming from. Yeah, they're... And the other one, and here's the shocking one, all right? Here's the spoiler. But if you're going to take advantage of the spoiler, you got to go to our Canadian deals page and use the links because we are an affiliate, is Best Buy Canada. Best Buy Canada is the best place to buy board games in Canada right now. It's amazing. Best Buy Canada has Gloomhaven for under $100 Canadian right now and a bunch of other sales. They have Founders, I think, for like 30 bucks. It's crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, surprisingly, Best Buy is branching out a lot more. Now, one of the things you have to watch out when you're going to bestbuy.ca is uh, Bellhop uh, Best Buy does have a marketplace similar to Amazon's yes, marketplace. You may not be buying from and them. And yes. you need to pay attention just because there's a, a couple of times I've gone looking for electronics 
and hey, I need to go, I need to get something. And it's one of those, you know, I'm not going to Amazon because I need it like that day. So I'm, I'm looking for, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to, something I can pick up at a store and trying to find something that they sell in the store sometimes can actually be difficult because they are driving their marketplace really hard. And I and guess Best Buy does not look like the Best Buy I used to go to. So we, I just oh, no. went there Monday. <laughs> yeah, Monday. no, walking into Monday a Best Buy with my is mom weird. and I haven't been in in probably a year. I, I didn't even recognize the store. Like, I wouldn't know where to buy a DVD in there now. I don't even know if you can. That used to, used to, you always walked in, it was the walls of DVDs, followed by the walls of audio stuff. And then on the left were the video games. And I'm like, I, I don't even know. Yeah, no, yeah, Best, Be Best Buy is just all over the it's place now. Weird. <laughs> like, it's weird. It's really weird. And they, and they, and they, 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 they rearrange things regularly. Like, that's, yeah. I, every once in a while, I'll walk into one and I'm like, oh, I have no idea where to go again. Yeah. And that yeah, that's, we were lost. That's a pain for me. I mean, I, I like some familiarity in a store. I mean, fine, you need to change things up. Great. But I don't want to have to bug your staff about where stuff are all the times. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Best Buy Online has games. In store, they had some. I don't know. I didn't go look at the board game section. I meant to. Right. Um, and yeah, support your local store as long as your local store deserves it. I just, I don't agree with supporting a local store just to support your local store. Like yeah. if that, that your reason is we need to have local game stores, so we must support them. No, I, I disagree with that. We can yeah. all meet up at a, at a coffee shop or a bar or whatever to play games. I don't need a local store, yeah. but if your local store is a friendly local game store and does things to support the local community, then yes, please support your local store. Yeah, Especially absolutely. if they have good prices. We happen to have a store here in Windsor that has great prices, so it is worth supporting them. But yeah. I refuse to support a store that sells for more than MSRP and then pretends that they have lower advertised prices. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the the whole the whole local game store, uh, you know, FLGS thing. It's it's not an FLGS if they aren't doing anything for the community, if and if they aren't at least trying in some part to you know make it make the deals worthwhile. You know, maybe they can't match prices from Board Game Bliss, but if they are offering enough value add then you know then it's willing to because if you're going out and how many times do you end up you know selling board games because you're going out to that local store you're running demos and people are saying oh this is a great game i can walk across the the floor and buy it right now yes. um which is just you know it's something you, you can't do with with amazon yes exactly no there's so. definitely reasons for local stores but the hardest thing is that the local stores have a hard time knowing what the stock, which is difficult. We Again, we've mentioned this many times in the last year. Too many games come out. It's it's impossible to stock them all. Absolutely. So that's been, the, for me lately, the, well, lately I've been getting my games through other sources for, for working with companies to get review copies, which is awesome that we're now doing well enough that that works. But before then, it was I would go to get the game and they couldn't get it. So I had to go to other sources because I tried the local store. And I'm like, look, I want to get this game. Can you guys get it in? Have you got it in yet? Can you get it in? All right, I'll just go buy it online. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's 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 a tough uh, it's a tough thing for all. Um. So uh, jumping back into the chat room, uh, Poncho seventy two is asking if you will move to Ohio so that you can start up a local game group and have less travel distance to Origins. <laughs> less travel distance to Origins. I mean, our travel distance is bad. It's like what three hours? That's nothing. Yeah. That's that's not that bad. But no, because unfortunately, Ohio is in the United States of America. And no offense to our fans who live there, I love you. I'm not a huge fan of your country and some of its policies, especially in recent years. I, I am very happy living in Canada. I am proud of the country I live in, and do not plan to leave it any time in my lifetime. Yep. Uh, now <laughs> coming to visit that might happen so poncho maybe we can hook up at origins it looks like we're going to be down there for an extended period of time and despite there there's a topic we can talk about we could talk about origins and their hotel mess but yeah well i mean I, I don't know how much of it is is origins fault and lack or versus you know origins lack of communication uh, it's, uh clarity it, it, on a positive note origins has gone above and beyond to apologize and correct the problem they claim they didn't know, which is fine, but right. yeah. yeah, Origins registration went live the other day and sold out like almost immediately. Right. But the site that you could buy the hotel blocks on were still showing rooms. And we're like, well, this is weird because we missed it. Like we weren't ready at 10 a.m. when it right. should have happened. And wow, it's weird. There's rooms. Okay, cool. We'll book a room. And while we're going to book a room, we noticed the same room, the same type of room at the same hotel 
cheaper in another browser window. I'm like, wow, that's weird. And I'm not going to get into the whole detail, but it ends up that this hotel site they were using, once they sold out the blocks, then started listing affiliate links to Expedia. So all of the rooms they're showing there aren't theirs anymore, they're Expedia's. And when you get those, those are non-refundable, despite the fact that all the Origins newsletters and emails they sent us are all, you have 72 hours notice to cancel, no problem canceling. And with us this year, we really want to go uh, Tuesday to Monday, which is an extended period of time, but I don't know if we can afford to go Tuesday to Monday. So what we wanted to do was book a room Tuesday to Monday, and then when it gets closer, if we can't do the whole thing, we'll cancel Tuesday or whatever, right? Well, now it's non-refundable, and they've already charged us because we bought from Expedia, and there was no way to know that. There was no disclosure. There was no indicator. You were buying from anywhere except this site, on-site or on whatever. I can't remember what they're called. So we complained, and, and they already reversed the charges. They've already sent us emails. They already said they'll do what they can. But by doing that, we now have no room. So that's not a great solution either. Yep. So basically, the site they were using basically bait and switched everyone. It looks like you were getting rooms from the Origins Hotel block, but they're just selling rooms in the local Columbus area. So it it was a mess. Yeah. No, it's it's unfortunate, and I didn't even know it was. I wasn't even anywhere near our computer, so I was uh, I was right out. So yeah, we do have something now. So we got to figure out what Sean's going to do if he's coming this year too. Yeah. No, it's. I wasn't. I had no idea it was even coming up. So. Uh, maybe check out Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, that's what a lot of people do. Yeah, I don't know. Talk to D off the air. Yeah, yeah. You might be able to hook we'll you figure up. Figure out something. Um. Alrighty. Uh, not too many questions, folks. Are we gonna uh, are we gonna make I this a short a couple. Any past Black Friday, Sunday, Mo Cyber Monday hot scores you can tell stories about. I almost want to put Deanna on the air for this one. <laughs> um, she could tell it better than I could. So one of the big sales that happens every year uh, that people look forward to is the Fantasy Flight holiday sale, which tends to go live. It, I don't. They don't call it a Black Friday sale or whatever, but it tends to go live. And they will have stuff ridiculously cheap, like board games for $5 to $20 US. And these are like the big coffin board games. So one year this happens, and Deanna goes on, and she buys me uh, Age of Conan, she bought me, I think it was Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition, but one of those big box games basically orders like three to $400 worth of games for $80 US is, is the final bill. Gets it shipped to Canada and is all happy. Like, oh my God, Mo's going to be, this is awesome. This is crazy. I mean, you got all these games coming because my birthday is also close to Christmas, right? So she was shopping for both at once. Well, it gets hit by Canadian customs. Fantasy Flight put on the full retail price for everything, even though we bought it on sale. And she ended up paying more in customs and duty fees than she paid for the games. It was like $120. It ended up costing her like as much as it would have cost just to go on Amazon and buy the games. It was insane. Right. So Fantasy Flight, amazing sale. And I'm sure they'll have another one this year because they do every year. Last year was the year I could have completed all my Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay collection because they had every single book dirt cheap, like two to five bucks each. But there's no way I'll ever buy off them again. Because they, for one, didn't mark it as a gift because this was a gift. They also put the full retail where it should have been the sale price. Like, it was terrible. Like, we got burned so bad on that one. Like, that was, we did not save money on that Black Friday. Yeah. Yeah, I got to say, I don't, uh, I don't do too much Black Friday sales. but Or if I do, it's usually, you know, trying to see if there happens to be a decent electronic sale or something. But, right. uh there's good ones every year. Like, like, there's certain places that only do Black Friday sales, like, like Broken Token. Their inserts, they never put them on sale. But Black Friday every year, they'll do 20 to 30% off. Right. And that is often stuff I get. Is, is Deanna will buy various box inserts. Because as we said many times, uh, not necessarily on the show, but I like to, I, like I say, for, for buying, it's really hard to buy for gamers. Because you never know what games they have. You don't know what expansions they have. You don't know what game's hot and they're excited about. You don't know what other people are going to buy them. You don't know what they bought themselves and so on. And it's just so much better to buy gamers stuff for the games they already have. I personally think those are the perfect gifts for gamers. So if you know your friend loves Suburbia and brings it out every week and it takes you half an hour to set it up as he pulls out all his baggies, get him the broken token insert for Suburbia. Now all of a sudden Suburbia comes out in minutes and now their game's more fun, right? Or you get them the overlays for Terraforming Mars so the cubes don't slide, stuff like that. And that's what Deanna has been doing for me for years now, like three or four years, which has been pretty cool. 
Yeah, no, I have to say, I am definitely going to be keeping an eye on Maple Game Deals uh, because, again, I know there are a couple of games I, I'm, I'm interested in this year, but I'm not paying MSRP for because, in, well, at least not in Canada, because uh, yeah. they're, they're pricey. There's, you know, some of the Harry Potter stuff uh, that I know my kids will want because, again, licensed games, still hot properties. Yep. You know, it's, uh, they're, they're pricey. Um, but I've got them, you know, I've got them marked on Amazon for, for MSRP tracking and, yeah, yeah. We'll, that's about uh, all. We'll see how it they goes. The Canadian deals are definitely harder to find than the U.S. deals. Yep. I, I get people complaining about that all the time. No, it, and it, it's true. I mean, you look at the two, you look at the two different pages on tabletopbellhop.com and you compare them, and yeah. there's no comparison. <laughs> yeah, the there just isn't. Up in the states, um, yeah, insane. I mean, you know, yeah. one of the one of the best deals on uh, out there right now is well, Sorcerer was a nice deal uh, yeah. in Canada, uh, but I mean, you know, Doctor Who Risk, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's, that's, you that's know, what tends to go on sale. That's the yeah. sort of thing that you're getting a lot of. Um, and it's, it's you know, it's just the market up here. Uh, it is what it is. But it's also, it's the distribution, it's the, the exchange rate, it's everything, right? Yep. From yep. what I hear, we have it way better than Australia. I, every, I get Australia wow. yeah. complaining every now and then about how much they pay. Well, like I mean, that's, that's for everything, though. Costing 80. I mean, everything in Australia. I mean, from TV to cell service to, you yeah. know, everything. It's just... um you know, they're, they're on the wrong end of the world. Uh, All right. I got a question for you, Sean, any games on your Christmas wish list? Uh, personally, I don't think so. I mean, I would still love to get the new, uh, DC, but I haven't had it. The other ones on the table. So the it's kind of one of the new the rebirth. One? Yeah. Uh, but again, since I haven't gotten anything else on the, any of it on the table at all, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, we can wait. Um, the dueling uh wizards harry potter one which is the the sort of the the follow-up to the harry potter's hogwarts battle uh i'm interested in it's a two-player um that looks interesting cool. uh, and then there was one other new one i'd have to open up my my uh, amazon wish list and see what uh what it was but there's another there was another new harry, newer harry potter game that came out that looks uh looks interesting enough and, and could have some real uh, table cool. value for the kids. Yeah, we never even went through the original Hogwarts battle. We need to bring that one back out. Yeah, well, we never finished the the monster box because it got so difficult. But uh, I should, I should, I should probably do that again. Yeah, uh, Dan has been playing games with the kids. We actually got um, she took Big G and taught her Splendor and one of your favorites, Valeria Card Kingdoms. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was great. And then, then, and, and then uh, Big yeah. G taught Little G. Yeah, uh, Splendor as well. Day. Yeah, yeah, the that next was awesome day we to see. Downstairs and Big G was teaching Little G how to play Splendor. Yeah. Sounded like they were having a lot of fun. Well, I didn't play with them, so it's not in my week in review. Deep well, you're not a big Splendor fan, but I like Splendor, no. so uh, it's all right. Yeah. It's all right. I don't um, mind Splendor. It's just I, I got sick of it quickly. I played a lot of it when we first got it. Yeah. For me, yeah. for Christmas, the main one, like I don't. Again, I, there's not a lot of board games I want because I'm trying to get them through other sources, and we still we're finally getting to the end. We've Almost played everything I got at Origins. We're almost done to the end of the review pile. I think March, I might actually get back to my own pile of shame by that point. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, but Tapestry, Tapestry just looks really good. That that one's up there. I put that on the wish list. And Space Base, because every time I talk about Valeria now, everyone's like, no, no, get Space Base. It's better. And I want to I want to see if that's uh, if that's actually better, if it's if it's worth it. Right. Uh, what about the uh, what about the new Azul? The new hot, the new. I, uh, you know what? I was so disappointed with Sintra that yeah. I'll try it first. I actually want to try it before I buy. Yeah, I like kind Sintra, of have to say, I, like I haven't gone back to Sintra. Like yeah. I had some fun with it when we first got it, but every time I'm going to pack for game night, I grab the original Azul. Yep. No, I, again, I, I I enjoyed Sintra. It was a fun game, but it was just a fun game. I yeah. I, I don't I wouldn't say. Um, you know, maybe it was because the original Azul came out first and we played it a bunch and, and, you know, we got more yeah. used to it. Um, but it was just so much more involved in, in Sintra where it wasn't, it, it had the same sort of feel, but there was more effort to it. Whereas yeah, you play the original like Azul work. and it was a fun game, but you didn't have that work aspect, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with the, the scoring. All right. Boudet. RPG ass any yet to be released games you're excited about. I, you know what? I am so far behind on the hype train <laughs> right now. Like I, I'm finally catching up on podcasts because I've been spending a lot of time sharing early Black Friday deals, and it's something I can I can listen to podcasts while I'm doing that. And like I'm finally getting to hear about some games that were hot a while ago. 
and I'm like, oh, Valaprazio from from uh, Stronghold Games sounds really cool, and uh, Clans of Caledonia, man, that looks good. But like that that came out a while ago. As for uh, yet to be released, I said Tapestry looks really fantastic, but that's out now. I can't think of anything I'm actually like waiting for, but again, I'm not. I, I haven't been catching up to know what the the hotness is. Like I would have to go to Board Game Geek. Look at the hotness and see if there's something there that I'd be excited about. Right. Is now Marvel Champions. I thought that was released. Oh no, okay, it does say 2019. For some oh, reason, so. yeah, so. no. For some reason, it was saying 2020 in one place, and then it changed over. The, the, I can't remember. The, they came out with the new Marvel miniature game and the new card game around the same time. Which one's right. that? The card game or the miniature? That's the game? card game is the is. Yeah, the... they were doing demos on Saturday when I was there, but I was doing demos of Cthulhu Death May Die, so I didn't get to see it. It's another living card game. I tend to avoid the living card games. Yep. Like I get it. It's it's not magic. And I I love the fact that you can just buy expansions, but I've yet to enjoy a single one of Fantasy Flight's living card games. Right. I tried Netrunner and I just couldn't get into it. I tried the Star Wars one and I just couldn't get into it. We tried Legend of the Five Rings and it was kind of neat, but I just, I don't know what it is. And like back in the day, we loved magic and we loved Middle Earth, the Wizards, and we loved the Cypher Star yeah. Trek. And I don't know why I can't get into these new ones. Uh, the Great Wall is coming out soon, 2020. Uh, yeah, that's asymmetrical that. soldier placement engine building. Uh, that nope. one sounds like it's up your uh, up your alley. Um, I don't know about theme wise, but uh, we're going nuts for Tainted Grail. Is that considered out yet? That I want to try because everyone's going so nuts about it. Uh, that I uh, that's no, that's 2019, so probably yeah. out already. The only one on the hotness right now is the Great Wall. It's 2020. Everything else is is out. Spirit Island is on the hot list, hot list right now. That's 2017. Probably an expansion coming or something. That's yeah, what maybe. I want to try. There's games uh, I want to play, but yep. I, there's not really anything I can think of this 2020. Like, when we went to Origins this year, I had no clue. Like, like I everyone was talking about that man's cabal. I didn't know until we right. got there, and I'm like, all right, cool. Marvel Protocol, that's the miniature game everyone seems yep. hot on. Yep. I, I have no real interest in picking up another miniature game either, so. No, and then and that's, you know. I, like I, I'm I, looking forward to uh, Eclipse, the new edition of Eclipse, but I already bought it. Like I bought it on <laughs> Kickstarter, and I want the dang thing to show up. Yeah, so that game looks great. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I had briefly been interested in that Titan game until we saw watched them <laughs> do the live play on uh, that wasn't on Titan, Twitch. Was it? That was something it wasn't, else. It was, yeah, it was, it was Titans. Not it wasn't called Titan, but it was. They were. I mean, it, it's about the yeah. the Titan era of yeah the Titan era uh, myth of mythos and. Uh, it looked really interesting on the Kickstarter, but man, did it not show well on stream. No, that did not look good that at all. scared me a lot, and I was so glad I had time to pull my oh, money out. Wait, I thought of one from 2020 I'm looking forward to. Back to the Future. Ah, from yes. The new Ravensburger. Because I... even ver the, the new Ravensburger licensed games have been great. Like, yeah. I haven't played Villainous, but everyone or not everyone seems to love it. Disney Villainous. Uh, Deanna even said it was pretty good, which is pretty good praise from her because it's not really her style of game. I've heard Villainous is great. I loved Horrified, as we talked about in the show last week. Jaws was pretty decent. I'm willing to give it another shot. Minecraft was good. I want to see what they do with Back to the Future. So there you go, Back to the Future. There's a game I'm actually looking forward to for next year. Yeah, I have to say, I am. I was not... I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of the Jaws game. Again, I enjoyed it. I had fun playing it, but it's not one that I would want to bother playing again. Uh, whereas Minecraft and Horrified... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll sit down and play Horrified again anytime. Um, I'm interested in trying it with, you know, the different monster combinations and different numbers of monsters. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's got something to oh, it. Oh, it's good. Uh, Minecraft. Um, yeah, again, it's it's got it's got a lot of thinky to it. I can I can definitely see myself probably getting tired of Minecraft before Horrified. Probably. Uh, but again, you know, it's a fun game and it's it's better for all ages, whereas Horrified mm -hmm. is, is more of a gamer's game. Uh, especially because of quarterbacking problems, right? If you've got an adult there, the kids are going to get a little less out of it, even if they are yeah. capable of playing. Yep. Um, but uh, no, they're they're definitely uh, shepherding licensed product well. Uh, yep. That that um, the house the the production house that's working on all those games. I'm trying to remember the name Prospero of it now. Prospero Hall. Prospero uh, Hall. I'm interested to know if they're the ones who are involved with the. Back to the future. Uh, Back to the future or not? Because if they are, I think that bodes well. Because they're the ones who did the villainous and and most of these new, um, mm -hmm. these new properties, and are they're really handling them well? Yeah, I've been very impressed overall. Really good. The Poncho seventy two asked, "Do we ever get a nice deal on a game at a thrift garage yard sale?" 
Yard sales, definitely. Um, mostly RPG stuff. We've got net yard sales over the years, often whole collections. I remember Deanna had found one at the end of the street somewhere and like called me. This is before the cell phone days. I was like, oh my God, this guy's got all this D&D stuff and he used to do art for magic and he has all this stuff. That one was really good. But for actual thrift stores and board games, the only thing I have ever found was the Marvel Heroescape, which Heroescape now goes for crazy money, but that was the the miniature game that came with hex plastic hex tiles. And the original Heroescape was like, you had a mixed match. So you'd have like robots fighting samurai, fighting Germans or whatever, all in one game. And it worked. And well, they put out a Marvel version, which was all Marvel characters and Marvel villains. And it was compatible. It all used the same system. And I found that for three bucks. And it was complete. When I opened it up, it actually had some bonus hero clicks in there. So someone was obviously using some hero clicks as other Marvel figures in it. So that's the one, like, of all the time, of all the times I've looked, RPG books, like, we found AD&D, copies of AD&D and stuff like that. But we just used to buy them to either trade them to other people or sell them. I've never, like, it wasn't stuff I wanted. But, like, you go to, like, Value Village and be like, hey, a player's handbook for five bucks for AD&D. And I'll pick it up and I'll throw it in the RPG book exchange or we'll throw it in the Extra Life auction or something like that. But board games, the only one ever. Like, I, I have never, people share online all the great games they found. The one time Marvel Heroes Cape, that was it for me. Yeah, I, I, I haven't, I haven't really been a yard sailor in years. Um, I just not something I really ever enjoyed going out and doing the the bargain hunting thing. So, um, I know Tech just found some wooden bowls. Yes, yes, <laughs> we saw awesome. those. We shared that in the Winter Gaming Resource. Yeah, we saw those. Absolutely, I saw that. I'm like, Tech found wooden bowls. That's what I look for when I go to thrift stores. Yeah, I look for more wooden bowls because twelve is still not enough to play. Um, I need enough to be able to play the colonists. Yeah, there you go. All right. Are we... Uh... All right. Jeff Seuss. What game do you own that you have wanted to play forever, but no one will play with you? Oh, there's so many of those. Um, RPGs, definitely. Dungeon Crawl Classic. Jeez, I've been trying for two years now. <laughs> we just can't get that dang group together to actually do it. Uh, board games? <coughs> the Star Wars stuff. Star Wars Armada. Star Wars X-Wing. I know there's a local community here in Windsor, but going out and having to cart my stuff to the local game store to play with these people who play very competitively isn't doesn't sound that appealing to me. I'm like, I want someone to just come to my house and play some X-Wing and Armada. I don't get enough use out of that. Um, Imperial Assault's almost the same thing, but that's the same group that we're playing DCC. <laughs> so we used to be able to get together to play Imperial Assault until someone switched to Afternoon Shift and that campaign fell apart. I kind of like to restart that one. And then there's the... The heavy games, right? So it's Deanna and I. I can never get people to play like Food Chain Magnate or Indonesia. Deanna will play them, but they're not good two-player. And it's not often we can get people out who want to play those heavier games. We can get the heavy-ish games, right? Like, like Vinhos being like close to the top. But like once you get past Vinhos, I have a real hard time getting a group together to play. Yeah, I have to say, there's not too much. Uh, I mean, board game wise, there's nothing I've got really that that I can't get to the table because the kid, you know, I buy games basically based on what my kids want to play mostly. Yeah. Uh, RPGs, absolutely, got because I don't play anything RPGs. I I got a bunch on the shelf that never get played because I just I just don't RPG anymore. Uh, other than other than a bit of online uh, game, I can I when I can manage to to find them. Uh, next now up, tech, mentioned, yeah, tech asking twelve of Canada. I've got that one. It's a great game. It's just best with five people. So you got to find five people who are willing to play. Right. But I, and I, I totally get where he's coming from though. He's saying it looks so boring at first blush, right? 1812 yeah. invasion of Canada doesn't sound like a great game. Now, understandably, I understand it's supposed to be actually a fantastic game. Uh, yeah. again, not necessarily my cup of tea, but uh, just, again, it's one of those games that, you know, you've got to, you've got to hook someone to uh, hook someone on mm -hmm. uh, and get them playing it for them to understand it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I find it draws people in once it's set up and you're playing. But yeah, just looking at the box. Yep. Now, Deanna is noting that we bought Hero Quest in French, which I have behind me. But we bought that in an antique mall and we paid 50 bucks. So to me, that's not a thrift find. 50 bucks for Hero Quest is a deal, but that's not like a $3, $5 thrift find to me. All right. Uh, Tex asking, what are the game accessories you can't live without? Well, I know one thing that you can that I'll, I'll, I'll answer for you. Okay. And that is your tabletop mats, your your yeah. sticky mats. Uh, that's Those the one awesome. unbeatable uh, accessory that you know no board gamer or even any gamer really should should go without. Yeah, and all it is a shelf liner. 
Yeah. You, you buy a shelf liner, a drawer liner. Yeah. You now you gotta be it. careful though, because some people shelf liner is the paper, the sticky paper. Yeah, it, this is which is not. This it, is this is a thicker, rubbery, rubberized. I don't know. It's like foam. Yeah. Stuff. It, it looks a little bit like um like a um a screen, but mm. it's it's not even. It's not you know it's not a regular line. It's the kind of a a a, a, a screen that went wrong Ooh. and is foam. Yeah, is like foam. Said, drawer liner, shelf liner. I've seen it called different things. You can buy it at the dollar store. I buy yeah. it at Canadian Tire because I trust the quality a little better. Yeah, at well, Canadian Tire, that. and I tend to cut them in half, like because uh, they're pretty big. So all of mine are actually sheets that have been cut in half. Um, the bowls, like something, it doesn't have to be bowls, but something to hold components. Every time I go to the local game store to run a game night and I forget the bowls, I'm frustrated. <laughs> I'm like, I hate piles of resources on the table yep. getting all mixed up. I love having bowls. Um, but yeah, the non-slip mats are huge. Um, I don't know. Nothing, nothing's totally like can't live without nothing's can't live without all of them. The only game accessory I can't live without is players to play the games. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as far as that, um, I said the bowls are definitely a good one. That, those are the main ones. Uh, and and uh, we, we we know who the RPG player is because uh, Jeff's can't uh, live, live without accessory is blank business cards and a Sharpie. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> that's it, which is a, a very RPG uh, accessory. Not not yeah, something that comes up too often in board cards, games. The business cards. Index, business cards a little small. I would go with index cards. Well, for business cards, I, I prefer like a fine, a fine point felt tip pen rather than a yeah. Sharpie. But uh, yeah. Sharpie and index, index cards. Oh, totally fair. All right. All right, we got anything else? I think that might be everything. We got anything on Twitter or anything anyone's I, asked? I've actually in the chat room. I've saw nothing, nothing they've tagged me on in Twitter. So All right. I do understand it's a holiday weekend for most people. So yep. totally fair. I have seen I'll a lot of a fair number of watchers today, which is pretty cool. So it's your last chance. We'll give you like five minutes or so. To, uh get a question in uh dice trays are nice again i don't i don't find them must have but like man when we're playing sorcerer oh sorcerer yeah. needs a dice tray that is one board game we found that, that we need a dice tray and yes i know ryan has a question out there but what's the best dice tray but i own one that i got a review copy from easy roller dice and i love it but it's the only one i've tried yeah. uh i i would have to compare that to box lids so i can't give you a really good answer there ryan until i get some more I have so if to any say, companies out there do dice rollers and they want to send them to me to review, I'd, I'd love to do a compare. I have to the say, looking look at, snap together. looking at the, uh, looking at, looking at people RPGing these days, I have to say back in the day, I wish I had had a dice tower to roll in. Um, I, I, you know what? I, it's a containment thing, right? So many times, you know, there's just so many dice rolling yeah. dice going around. Whereas, you know, a nice dice tower where you just grab your dice and drop them in just, Keeps everything nice and, and and keeps your your player area smaller and tighter. And I gotta say, I kind of like that. The noise problem I can see, but you can get the felt line ones, so you can deal with the yeah, noise. Yeah, I, I, we got. I wanted a dice tower for a while, and then they had them for tabletop day. One of the ones when Will Wheaton was still involved, and I got the Meeple dice tower. And I was all excited to bring it home, and I used it one night, and I hated it. And I don't even know why. It was just like a pain having to pick the dice up and drop them in, and then it often was in the way, so you had to turn it to actually see the results, and mm. it just. It was more fuss. I'm like, it's much easier to roll on the table, That's fair. which is why I like the dice tray. So like, right. you're still rolling into something, so you're still constrained. Yeah, you I, don't well, I mean, that dice tray, dice tray would work as well, I guess. All really, through. and I, people like them. Like, I know Wingspan even comes with one, and supposedly they're more random. Though I've never been one to think people are really cheating with their die rolls in my house. Uh, here's that one from Boudet RPG. Product license that you want to see a good board game made for. <laughs> this will piss some people off. Dune. I, that was my answer. You know what? Oh, that's <laughs> absolutely what I was going to say. I'm like, uh, I want to see a good Dune game that's not the 1970s Avalon Hill trading AP stab your friends in the back. You know what? The, and I, the, I suspect we are going to get one. We when this when the new film series comes. You know when we when we when we get to uh, when when we get to this new this new you know. Uh, generation of Dune. Yeah. I suspect it will reinvigorate the property, and we will probably see new games based on it, depending on how the licenses roll out. That's what always... I would love to see is an updated version of the StarCraft board game or Forbidden Stars done as Dune, with the different factions, where it's more like the old Dune 
real-time strategy game that was on the computer right. where you yep. have to send your spice harvesters out and yep. your ornithopters and explore. I would love to see like a 4X too is what I would like to see. I'd love to see a licensed RPG too that isn't the Lost Unicorn game that died before it was released. Right. Uh, what else? Um, uh, Deanna mentions Labyrinth. Yes, Labyrinth Dark Crystal because the company that got it did such a bad job. Yeah, we, we, we need to erase. Crystal, so we I need to erase Dark those Crystal, games. But I've heard. Yeah, we I need to like, erase those games from the from the the memory with something of quality. Yeah. I, I would love to see a good Labyrinth game, though. I don't know what I'd do with Labyrinth. Like what you would what you would do with it as a board game to make it more interesting. That wouldn't just be Talisman or something where you're yeah. wandering the board and eventually you unlock a new spot. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost a roll and move. I mean, you know, the game of life turned into <laughs> Labyrinth. Is it, uh, talisman is, it just changed yeah. the ending, so it's Jareth instead of the Crown of Command, and you've got your Labyrinth board game. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You're no, in a absolutely. maze instead. Just change the names. Just re-theme re re all the, the spots. Speaking of which, they just released, uh, they, they did it Batman Talisman. I had no idea. Hmm. It's Batman Talisman. You're the villains, and you're in Arkham, and you're trying to escape, and the middle spot is the door to get out. And I'm like, wow, that's quite the re-theme. All right. Uh, what else do we have for licensed? Um, someone asked, what is a good cyberpunk board game? Uh, there's a couple that I liked. So City of Remnants looked pretty neat. I need to give it another try. It was trying to do too many things at once. So it's Plot Hat Games, so they're good at making games. Deck building was still pretty new. And it's like they tried to throw in um, city building and putting out territories, polyominoes on a board, area control with grid attacks, like um, not battleship, but like uh, where you're like roll two coordinates for something to happen with deck building. And I got to admit, when I first tried it, it was overwhelming, but I have played a lot more games since and especially deck building mechanic I'm used to. So I'd like to give that another try. I personally thought Android was really neat. It was basically a Philip K. Dick novel in a board game format, but it's long. It was way too long. Uh, you were trying to solve a murder mystery, and there was hacking. Like, it had all the tropes. It had You had your flying cars, and people's cars flew at different amounts, and all your characters had a dark secret, and their dark secrets could come out. If you want, like, a cyberpunk experience in a board game, Android would would be my number one recommendation. But, man, you gotta. it's, it's a game night game. You have to, you have to, you have to expect to play it. And they had like a really good mechanic for determining who the murder mystery was partway through the game. So you didn't know, like, but like, so you couldn't cheat. You couldn't, there wasn't clue, right? It wasn't right. predetermined at the beginning. It was somewhat driven by what players did. And part of the game that was a problem is someone could pay to assassinate one of the possible people and someone could assassinate your suspect. And then you seem like you were kind of out of the game. That one was right. neat uh okay what do we got here uh on board game night how do you decide what to bring uh personally it's it's a mix of what i'm excited about what i've seen other people ask me they want to play so it's uh lately it's what i want to get reviewed right so games i need to do reviews on so i bring out it's work right like there are games i need to play so i bring those out and it's just the buzz right so i go out to an event and while we're talking at the event someone's like oh i really want to try that i make a little mental note in my head to bring out next time and then a mix of casual, easy to play games for new gamers. So I will always grab like an Azul, Gokuku, Splendor, Gizmos, um, Sagrada, those types of games. So I just have them on hand so that if I do show up to a game night and there's new people there, I have games that are accessible to play for new people. I used to, back in the day, it used to always be Bonanza, Catan, and Carcassonne was what I brought to every event. Nowadays, I mix it up more, and I'll switch it. I'll be like, oh, I haven't brought Azula for a couple weeks, and I'll bring that. Oh, I haven't brought Gizmo for a couple weeks. Oh, Go cuckoo has been coming out almost every night since I got it, though, because that one's just so much fun. Uh, and how do you bring your games to uh, to the store? <laughs> uh, mostly uh, milk crates. We were lucky enough to have a ton of milk crates uh, back in the day. Deanna and I had made a table out of them in our first apartment where we just put a sheet over the milk crates. Uh, we have a lot of milk crates, and milk crates are perfect size for that standard ticket to rise size box. So they can lay flat, and then the other size boxes I stand up. Um, every now and then I'll use banker boxes because I recently got a bunch of games that are way too big to fit in milk crates, which annoys me. Uh, Veenhost being one of them, Tyrants of the Underdark being another one. 
I'm like, no, stick to the standard size boxes, people. Like that that is something I wish the gaming industry would do was standardize their box size. I wish there was like a small board game box, a medium board game box, and a big board game box. It'll never happen. But and unfortunately, bankers boxes, uh, depending on how heavy the game is, those handles don't always uh support yeah, a lot of they weight. Don't, they don't so make... not not great. That actually happened with their extra life. Yep. Uh, yeah, milk crates are awesome. If you can get your hands on some milk crates, like I said, they literally your your standard board game box, you're gonna be able to fit three to four games and still be able to stack the milk crate. What I usually do is two of those and then the odd size excuse me, boxes I stand up. Now, Poncho asked a question. The shit says he doesn't watch enough of our Gloomhaven streaming because Poncho is <laughs> asking, Do you ever try to play some themed background music or sound effects while gaming? Yes, actually. Uh, we used to do that all the time. So whenever we had game night, we used to put on Spotify. But then I decided to go independent and do this full time. And we can't afford subscription services anymore. And the advertisements drive me nuts. So it used to be literally we would sit there and, and we did a whole episode on this, actually, uh, about theme game nights that pretty much if you go into Spotify and search for a game, you will find a soundtrack. Like you can put Terraforming Mars soundtrack and someone will have made a playlist and you will put Azul soundtrack and someone will have made a playlist. Like it's kind of shocking that people have taken the amount of time that there are bands that are dedicated enough to put these together, but they're there and we would still use them. It was literally anytime we sat, we play music, but now we also stream a lot of our games and we can't play licensed music while streaming games. So that's a problem. Uh, plus ads like it, it, I gotta admit hearing an ad in the middle of a game does bring me out of the game. It depends on the game we're playing. It's something like Azul. I don't mind being brought out, but if we're playing something thematic, it's like, oh, now I got to grab my phone and skip the ad or mute it, and it drives me nuts. And sometimes some of those streaming services have a lot of ads a lot of often. But not only that, they're the same stupid ads over and over, and that's what drives me the nuts the most. Now, for Gloomhaven, what I use is tabletop audio, which is free to use. It's it's non-licensed music or it's licensed with a – you're allowed to use it for streaming. Uh, tabletop audio is fantastic. It does music – and ambiance and sound effects for background noise. And it's something I've been using from back when I used to run Warhammer, third edition. I used it and used the tavern sounds and I used the travel sounds. And now I use that for Gloomhaven. And I theme it based on the scenario we're doing. So if we're in the sewers, I use the sewer one. If we're in the cistern, I use the cistern one. So like when we did um, the playthroughs on the weekend, when Kat was doing her, she was in a forest. So I found a forest soundtrack that just has like birds chirping and forest sounds. So yes, I love to have sound in the background. Absolutely, uh, and so I, I wasn't trying. I wasn't trying to be mean to you there, uh, <laughs> Pancho. Yeah, Pancho. We not not everyone. Not everyone loves to sit around and watch other people play board games for hours on end. And Gloomhaven no. is a is a lengthy one. We've got some. We've got some hardcore fans who really do enjoy it and know the game and help out. And there are our folks in the chairs who are yes, awesome we, and much have, appreciated. Tamujin and here. the gang. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we love having them around, but it is definitely not for everybody. There's no question about that. Yeah. Um, we, we have some fans of our Gloomhaven stream, which is pretty awesome. I've been told that they, you don't hear the background audio on the stream. It's but I pretty, don't... uh, lately it has been being picked up, uh, for a while. I had no idea you were doing it. Yeah. Uh, but in the past month or so, I've been noticing it, uh, I'm yeah. in, able to hear. So. Fortune and Glory, a CD for background. That's cool. We used to do CDs for background for a while. Yep. We were playing something the other day, and we broke out the pirate shanties. I can't remember what we were playing that required pirate shanties, but we broke them out. That horrible game with the, moving your cell phones on the board? No, that wasn't <laughs> it. I think I sold that. Endeavor. Uh, there you go. We were playing Endeavor, Age of Sail. Ah, uh, there you That's go. We put out the pirate shanties on that one the other day. Those are not safe for, for work pirate shanties. <laughs> Are, are any pirate shanties safe no, to work unless you're a pirate? Ones. These uh, are supposedly authentic pirate shanties, and right. they're, they're pretty vulgar. All righty. All right, it's almost 1030. I think at this point we've answered some questions. Thank you very much, everyone who asked questions. We're a little slow there for a bit in the middle, but everyone stepped up. Uh, I, we got a pretty good crowd in the room. I'm pretty happy by the way this turned out by the end. So thank yeah, you, okay. everyone, for your questions. Again, we will be doing this again, maybe, because let's see, yeah. We're probably not doing an AMA in December. No, probably it, not. It is unlikely. I, I'm up for doing it, but I don't think Sean's going to be up for doing it. Well, I'm, I'm up for doing it. I don't think we're going to have anyone else around yeah, because no, of the No date. one's going to join us Christmas yeah. Day. We'll have yeah. a Christmas Day AMA. Come on, it rhymes. Hey. Christmas Day AMA. We might do it. There's a chance. Yeah. There's a chance. We'll <laughs> be streaming on Christmas. 
Because by then our kids should be in bed. Like, what else are we going to do go. Christmas Day at 9 o'clock at night? <laughs> All <laughs> right. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop segment. If you'd like to read more gaming and game advice, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Uh, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with several things in the works, like our new uh, look in the, on the stream right now. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Yeah, I'd love to hear some feedback. I don't know if you guys noticed, we got our new logo in the corner. I'm the wrong size. We're working on that. <laughs> getting through, <laughs> getting the, through the, the sizing new, issues, unfortunately. Yeah. Because of uh, time constraints this week, we I built everything, but we didn't have a time. We didn't have time to uh, size things in advance. Yeah. So I, that's our fault. Deanna and I were a little busy to get on a stream ahead of time to test things out. So yeah, you get to see a lot more of us. We're bigger. We take up more room now. <laughs> we're we're a little more zoomed in actually. So you probably actually see less of us, but we're bigger. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, we got we got a new look. We're working on it. We're working on the, the rebranding with the new logo. What we're hoping to get launched soon is the merch. We got to get that up. Everything happens after after Black Friday. We got we got way too much stuff going on for for this week. So for those of you who listen to us on Tuesday, we're probably sleeping right now. Even though it's ten at night, we've probably been sleeping a lot. Ah, uh, newsletter. Every week I send out a newsletter. Go to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com to sign up. We let you know everything we put out every week, uh, the videos we put out, any news we've got, any reviews we've launched, and the questions we've answered, and things like, hey, we do AMAs once a month, stuff like that. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, we mentioned already the holidays are coming up, right? Uh, at this point, hopefully you're done most of your shopping, but if you're not, check out our gamer gift guides. Uh, we talked about this in the last segment. Gamers are hard to shop for, so we've got a bunch of gift suggestions that aren't just more games. So, you can find these over at blog at tabletopbellhop.com by clicking on the gift guides or get to them directly at tabletopbellhop.com slash gifts. All right, a quick shout out to RPG and Co. yet again, uh, Brian Weiss. So that nice new Bellhop logo you got there, the nice thing at the top, and this shirt all come from RPG and Co., uh, which you can find at playrpgandco.com. Uh, really impressed by Brian's work. He did all the work in the logo. We went back and forth, and I got to say that's a lot more iconic than what we had before. So I do appreciate Aaron drawing that original bell line outline for us back in the day. Absolutely. But we've grown and become more colorful, and now we ding. Yep. Up next, a look at King of the Dice from Haba, USA. Uh, King of the Dice is one of the many games I brought home from Origins 2019. It was designed by Nils Nilsson, featuring art by Gus Batts. It was published by Haba Games in 2017, at least in North America. It might have been earlier than that in Germany. Uh, it's one of the first games they put out in what they call their Game Night Approved Game Series. Now, for those who haven't checked out our unboxing video on YouTube, what's in the box? Uh, it's a small box, really tiny box, actually like a... Uh, Almost, almost like ah, bigger than Uno, but a, a nice tiny box. Not a lot inside it. Uh, there's the rules, which are written in two languages, French and English. The actual rules are four pages, and there are a ton of examples in there. Actually, examples of all the cards. Tons of graphics in the rule book. Lots of examples. Every single card types highlighted, described. Uh, great reference for once you play. Then there's the dice. These are pretty much standard D6s with one extra touch. They're wooden, they're a little oversized, but in addition to having pips one through six on like any other D6, each side is also color coded, either red, green, or blue. And there's an equal number of each pip in each color. So there's two blue ones, there's two red ones, and there's two green ones. Quality of the dice is really nice. Like these are nice silk screened. The, the color's not rubbing off these anytime soon. Uh, then you got a deck of cards. The deck has a bunch of different sets in it. There are citizens, which are different fantasy races and creatures. There are domains, which are places where these people live. And then there's a deck of scoundrels. Now, the lo locations are horizontally oriented, where the rest are a portrait like normal cards. Artwork is very bright and colorful with a cartoon feel that I really liked. Um, 
hopefully they don't get in trouble for this, but I gotta say it looks Disney-like to me. It looks like a Disney style of animation. Icons that are on the cards that you need while you play are large and very clear. Uh, not a lot in the box, but you know what? You don't need a lot in a box for a good game. Uh, so I, I agree. I think the, the artwork is great. It is very colorful. Uh, for me, it's more like a Saturday morning, uh, maybe a Nickelodeon or something maybe more than Disney. Okay. Uh, but it's definitely a kid-friendly cartoon yep. uh, graphics. Uh, the one comment I have about the graphics that I've seen, again, I haven't, I haven't played this game yet, but I have been uh, tracking uh, some comments and things going on, is that some of the graphics on them aren't 100% uh, visually uh, friendly for colorblindness. They, they haven't differentia differentiated shapes, and they've gone with just color differentiation on mm -hmm. some things. And so that's a bit problematic. But other than yeah, that, yeah. it's 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 very, you know, big, big and visible in most cases. And to be honest, like just by choosing red and green as two of your colors, yeah, I know those are the two colorblind problem colors, right? Right. So that's why being able to tell the red and the green apart could definitely be an issue. Right. All right. So uh, what do we now that we know what you get? How do you play? Well, you start, you lay out the domain cards in stacks with descending point values. Uh, they get laid out, and then underneath each domain, you're going to draw and place one of the citizen cards. Shuffle the scoundrels, put that deck face up. That's it for setup, takes seconds. Each player then rolls all six dice, and you're trying to meet the requirements shown on the bottom of one of the citizen cards. Now, depending on the color and the creature of each card represents, you'll need different things. For example, fairies need sets of different colors, like you might need two red and three green dice. Dwarves all want dice with the same numbers. You might need four fives or six sixes. Elves require straights, dice that go one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Each citizen is worth different points based on how difficult the dice combination is. Players can re-roll some or all of their dice twice, just like Yahtzee and almost every dice game ever produced, trying to match one of the cards in play. If they manage to make a match, they get to take the citizen and put it in their scoring pile. Now, here's the neat part in this game is if the color of that citizen matches the domain they're under, so the city they're in or the place they're in, you also get to claim that domain card too. So when players can't make a match after three rolls, they're forced to take a scoundrel. Now, these are worth negative points and go into your deck, and the, 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 that's your penalty for not succeeding. After a card's claimed, the citizens in play all slide down to fill the gap. Or if a scoundrel was taken, the last one goes off and you put a new one out. You keep playing until two stacks of domain cards are claimed, the last scoundrel is claimed, or the deck of citizens run out. At that point, you just add up all the points on your cards and score points. Now, to keep things interesting, some of the citizen cards have special abilities. For example, elves let players take another turn if they're on the top of your scoring pile. And as long as they stay on the top of your scoring pile, you get to take two turns in a row. Hopefully they don't stay there too long. Fairies, though, only score points. You have lots of them. The way they work is one fairy is worth one point, two fairies are worth two points each, three fairies are worth three points each, and so on. Dragons are actually bad cards that you play into an opponent's deck and so on. They all have their own little funky things. Now, for the first few games, I do have to admit, you're probably going to have to look these up in the rules, but there is a card-by-card -card reference that's very clear. Yeah, no, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to this game. Uh, again, one of its only real problems is that it is a gussied-up version of Yahtzee. Uh, and so you are dealing with a massive amount of randomness. Yep. Now, the big thing Haba has been pushing with these game night games is to show that their games aren't just for kids. Uh, as far as I know, King of the Dice, uh, as far as it goes, anyone who's listened to the podcast after I got back from Origins will probably realize I've been playing this a lot with adults. And most of the games I played with adults. Now, yes, I did play with my kids, and my kids both do enjoy it. It has hit the table way more often at public play gaming events than it has at home. And I have found it's a great gateway game for non-gamers, but at best a filler game for experienced players. It's interesting, because I, I don't see a lot of that uh, playing out anywhere else. So it's interesting that you've had that experience, yeah. when I'm not seeing uh, many people agreeing that, that it's, it's a game for anyone else other than kids. Yeah, what I think it is, is they have it stuck in their head that Haba makes kids games. And they buy it from Haba thinking that Haba makes kids game. They probably haven't even tried it. Because we brought it out to one of the easy mode events, and I taught Sean Hamilton and a group of players how to play it. And they had a great time. They played three times in a row. 
And then I left and did other things. And then Sean Hamilton taught a group of new people who showed up later in the night. And I think they played seven times throughout the night. And then we had someone come up at the end, ask where they could buy the game. So it definitely adults are appealing to it. And I just wonder if people aren't trying it with that audience with it stuck in their head. This is a kid's game. Uh, it's interesting because I, I do see a lot of comments saying that this is a great kid's game, but I, I can't buy, I won't play this with adults. Uh, again, this well, is uh, the randomness is a big issue. There's a yeah. lot of gamers out there who are dead set against uh, randomness to any degree and to some degree. But I mean, this is a very random game and, and that, you know, this is a, this is not a difficult game. It's got a weight of one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta say, it's gotta be higher than one. That, uh, 1. I, that, I think that's, that's some gatekeeping there from some board game geek users who refuse to rate games on a fair scale. That, yeah. that, it's it's higher than a one. It's got to be because what I like about it is that there is some strategy. It's not just rolling the dice. I, what do they give Yahtzee a weight by more than ones? Because every time you roll, you got to work. You're working out the odds in your head, trying to determine which card to go for. And it's a fact that there's multiple cards you can choose from. It's like okay, that one's obviously easy. This one's going to be hard. You roll that first set of dice. You look at what you're getting close to, and then you're like, oh man, all I need is one to get this, but it's a one in six chance. And what do I need to get this? is a color. Well, colors are one in three chance. So there's a better chance I'll get that, but it's worth more points and so on. Plus there's the whole domains, right? So there's the, I could grab this card now, but if I wait till next turn, it's going to be under the proper domain and be worth bonus points. And it also the domain cards are going to push the end of the game. So if you're losing, you don't want to take a domain card that would end the game. Whereas if you're winning, you want to rush the end. Like to me, that's all stuff that puts it a step above games, simply just Yahtzee. Well, again, it's, it's a 1.08. So, <laughs> so ooh, it's a little bit more name. Yeah. I don't know. Like, like to me, this is the this is what makes the game appeal to adults as well as kids. Now, this is the stuff that makes it great for kids, because what I like is that the dice have the colors. Right. So it's not just numbers. So as far as teaching kids probability and counting, you're throwing in that totally different mix of probabilities. And I think that's cool to see that as opposed to other push your luck games that just use standard dice, like even King of Tokyo, I, I think as simpler probability math in it than this does because seeing my kids realize that it's easier to roll a specific color than to roll a specific number was a wonderful thing right seeing especially little g pick up on it going oh it's easier for me to roll a green than it is to roll a six i thought was cool and it's the youngest one that really digs it right but yeah as you mentioned it, it's yahtzee right it, it's it's a yahtzee based dice roller and there's a huge random factor and sometimes there's going to be nothing you can do because of bad die rolls. And multiple plays, it can be particularly brutal if you get a whole bunch, especially the elves where you need sequences or a whole bunch of the dice where you need specific numbers that you just take scoundrel after scoundrel after scoundrel because no one can make those dice rolls. And I think Deanna put it well when she said, I prefer games where I feel I have more control of my destiny. Yeah, and, and uh, it's it's problematic, I find, that not only is it, luck whether or not you can get something or not i mean it's just you know you can roll three times and not get anything and you're penalized for having bad luck um yeah. and that's 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 a that's an interesting thing also uh interesting note uh at one point the game the the card that was the scoundrel was actually the village idiot and yeah. was a very problematic card uh apparently um that that there were many concerns brought up about that they have since replaced it with the scoundrel card. So uh, uh, it's the exact same card. They just changed what it was called. Uh, I don't, I, I believe the image is different or no. Is it? I don't think so. Uh, it, it, I it know when a... we're playing, we often call it that. Oh, okay. Interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to take a look at the card and see. Based uh... on the artwork, it, it does get called that. And I often have to oh. correct, correct people. The fool, the village idiot, it's been called both. And I usually say, no, no, it's the scoundrel. It doesn't look very scoundrelly. Uh, so one of the things that randomness is good for, right, is it evens the playing field. And this is what makes a lot of kids games, kids games and, and good for kids is because even an eight year old has a chance to beat her heavy year old loving mom in a game because of the randomness factor. Right. Because if it was a pure strategy game, there's no way little G is going to beat Deanna at most games she plays where throwing in that random factor gives them that chance. Right. I, I don't know. I, I personally found the randomness to be lower than other similar dice games. Like I said, we mentioned Yahtzee. I think there's more probability, more you can affect your chances, more odds you can play, or say even roll for it from Calliope games, which is a game very similar to this one. Uh, the very different card types usually means there's something easy you could go for, 
if you don't want to push your luck. I don't know. I, I'm glad I picked it up uh, while I was at Origins. It's seen a steady amount of gameplay since I got it, and I expect to see more in the future. Uh, both my kids like to play it. They play it on their own. They play it with me, as well as bring it up for adults. Like I said, I, uh, when I go out to a public event, I like to bring some really easy, accessible games. This is one of the games I'll grab just to have on hand in case we meet some new gamers who aren't used to the, the more modern hobby board games. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely... There, there's definitely a mix of people, uh, and I think a lot of it really comes down to the degree of randomness you like in your games. Uh, yep. and, and especially if you are coming from a more mass market, uh, you know, perspective, you're so used to that randomness mm. that it feels comfortable. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of that wedge into the gaming, whereas you've got the randomness, it is Yahtzee, but right. you've got the cards and you've got that that extra, you know, ushering someone into the world of hobby gaming now for a more in-depth look at the king of dice head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews king of the dice king of the dice and now the bellhops tabletop where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year what games hit our tables Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review uh, at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So this past week, I hosted a Cthulhu Death May Die demo night at the CG Realm. Uh, there, I taught a few different groups of players this two-fisted pulp Cthulhu board game. If you go back to For the Kids, our 66th podcast episode, you can listen in on our full review Check out the review on the blog or YouTube. So basically everything I said in that review, those reviews still stand. If you, you were around to listen to that or if you gone and checked them out, I really dig how different this Cthulhu game is compared to other mythos based games. This is a dice chucking, smash the monsters in the face, high tension co-op game. Yeah, it's a fun and enter energetic, uh, you know, Elder Gods game as opposed to that sort of dreary and you know ever over overbearing pressure of failure yeah now the first game we played on saturday we broke out scenario one which i played before but chose haster as our elder god and i was really pleased to see what a difference that made the king in yellow is all about mark marking characters with yellow signs and these are tokens you're going to take while you're playing and you get marked up by a bunch of them before he's summoned. And then once he's summoned, he does extra damage and sanity loss based on those marks once he's on the board, which I thought was really cool. We played five players and managed a very close win, like really close win. More importantly, though, everyone who tried the game really liked it. Uh, this was one where they were checking the MSRP. People were grabbing the box. People were wondering where I got it and stuff like that. And people were trying to figure out oh, what scenarios come with it. I remember one of the local gamers in particular was really shocked by the amount of content that comes in the base box. Now, this was a really mixed group of gamers, which was cool. So we had gamers with different experience levels. One of them was a heavy miniature war gamer. Uh, we also had um, a gentleman who's pretty new to hobby board gaming mixed in with the crew. So it was good to see, uh, as well as Mythos background like i i don't know much mythos stuff and we had someone there that was an expert and was busy explaining why different things were happening because we fought ghouls for example and he's like i'm like why when you fail to call a ghoul does another ghoul happen and he's like oh because they scream and i'm like what and he's like oh you never find one ghoul it's it's part of the mythos that you never face one ghoul where there's one ghoul there's more i'm like all right cool so it was neat to have a group that was all mixed up like a, a, a mixed experience levels both gaming and mythos wise and everyone that played it dug it that first game yeah, no, that's, it's a fantastic game. Uh, now I have to say, we, we had, we played it originally with five players and yep. still barely uh, eked through. It was, it was pretty close that time too. Now with a, with a collection of, of some newer gamers in there, was there any quarterbacking going on? Is that uh, something I, you were seeing at all? I noticed like that there was definitely discussion on what's going on. Right. But I, what I found with this game, like maybe once, this is one of the things that, that, that fights against quarterbacking. Every character has their own sets of skills and they're all different. And that is something that makes quarterbacking really difficult because unless you know that every character, every ability, everything they have, it's really hard to tell someone else what to do. And especially first times playing, you're more focused on trying to learn what you can do because we did have that problem. It's the, you know, you roll the dice and two turns later, you're like, oh, shoot, I forgot I had brawling. I should have had another green die. Oh, shoot, I didn't realize I could have snuck past this guy because I have this. You're so focused on your own board and trying to play your own character while worrying about your own insanity as well in this game. 
and the result of your own mythos card that it's really hard to try to tell anyone else what to do. And in general, it's something I do find that that does reduce quarterbacking in any co-op game. Basically, c complexity of your own character. Enough stuff you have to worry about, that you don't have the time to worry about other people. Right. Now, the second game we played, which had some of the same people as well as some new people in, I broke out episode two of the first season and went back to fighting Cthulhu, mainly to show off the miniatures for people. Uh, this is where another disappointment for me set in, and I mentioned this earlier in the show. Not only is this not a campaign game, in the fact that nothing carries over from one game to the next. You play the game, it doesn't matter how well you did, how how quick you lost, how how awesome your character was. Next time you play, none of that matters. It's completely standalone. And there's no character advancement. There's no nothing else. The actual, actual episodes aren't linked together either. Like, there is no story. Each box is a completely standalone thing that has nothing to do with anything else. Like, there, you, there's no reason you couldn't start off with Season 1, Box 3, and then go to Season 3, Box 2. It doesn't matter. And I just found that really weird, because they call them seasons, and they call them episodes, and why call it season? Like, to me, season implies a story arc. Yeah, this this sounds like um, a, a marketing theming problem. Um, I Again, I, I we talked about this earlier in the show. I'm not really... Uh, horribly upset about the the lack of of continuity, the lack of a campaign, the lack of character advancement. I think that's that's fine uh, because of the fact that again, you're not supposed to meet an elder god more than once <laughs> for various reasons. Either you kill it or it kills you, but you're not yeah. going to see them once again. So in that uh, essence, making it sort of a a sec a set of one offs makes sense. But taking that set of one-offs and giving it a season and episodic right. concept is questionable, especially if the over our overall theme, if there isn't a thread of story somewhere now, maybe, maybe somewhere in the marketing uh, or in the, in the PR department, there was like whoever wrote this originally had a thought about the theme, but if it's lost in the game, you know, they should have, they should have lost the concept of theme yeah. just called it box one box two or yeah, know, box not, a like, box b <laughs> yeah like they, even one two implies some type of um sequence required right i i, I don't know I, I definitely did ramp up in difficulty so maybe there's a one and two okay i i don't know i i, I get it in a way like i i do admit there is an appeal to i grab the box friends are coming over tonight none of them have played before i grab it and i'm like eh, let's play scenario five and let's play against this elder guy I, it's fair I just personally would have liked some actual story here. Yep. As for the people I was playing with, because just their opinion matters as well, they were split, right? Some of them loved the fact they could just break this out, especially the miniature war gamer. It was like, this is awesome. Like, I, I sit there and uh, we sit there and we play a game of Star Wars Legion and we finish early. I can just pull this game out. Like, oh, let's take on Cthulhu and see what happens in the lab, right? I could pick a couple boxes and go. But then others like me were like, man, it's just like, I want to know what's going to happen. And now that we saved the burning lab, like the, we saved Miskatonic University, it's no longer on fire. So what? So what happens next? They would have been more impressed with a more connected story. Well, now, to be unfair, this is a Simon game. And yes. the fact that the miniature gamers are really cool and really hot on this concept does say that Gwomini or not has done something yeah, on brand. So, yeah. There is that. And I got to admit that the miniatures, I, this is a side note, this isn't even in my show notes for tonight, but one of the things is um, store owner Ian has no interest in playing this game at all, but he's buying a copy because he did the math and is working out to $2.50 a miniature. And he runs a lot of Call of Cthulhu. So he is getting miniatures and some really cool map boards and some tokens he'll probably be able to use for his role-playing game at two fifty a miniature. And I gotta say, two fifty a miniature is actually a very good price. Yep. Yep. All right, back to the actual gameplay. Uh, this was still solid. Season two part or season one part two was very different, which was good to see. Um, this one felt more like an investigation game while still keeping that pulpy touch. But this one definitely had more of the investigation, existential horror going on more of the insanity. Uh, the thing here is you're trying to collect two of four mythos tomes, but to get them, you have to discover two runes per book and everyone's gonna pick up different runes and you gotta trade with each other to get the right runes to get the book, which is very Lovecraft Cthulhu. But to get those runes, you have to kill and search the bodies of cultists. 
which gets back to that Howard two-fisted pulp feel. So I yeah. dig it. It was it was a nice meshing of the two styles of game. Yeah, love Lovecraftian uh, horror doesn't really have you going out there and 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 kicking ass, and looting bodies and looting bodies. Yes, that's that's definitely Howard. The, the um, special move in this was loot the body. Loot the cultist. <laughs> that, that was the special move in this. And then the other one was claim a tome, which you had to discard. Right. As opposed to putting out fires. Thing, actually. <laughs> well, this is a neat thing that came up. So a fire started in this scenario. This scenario does not have a move put out the fire. So that was neat to see. So that's an interesting mechanic. A fire that starts in scenario two cannot be put out. Hmm. That was neat. So uh, besides a change in tone, um, there was... The other major change in this scenario was, holy cow, was stress important? Like the first scenario, stress was just this thing that you'd yeah. spend now and then to reroll dice, and you tended to max it out early and not care. In Act 2, stress is everything. You need stress when you discover things, when you're flipping discovery cards. And if you don't, you become terrified. If you don't have the stress to discover what it is, you're terrified. You need stress when mythos cards are drawn. And they're going to say stuff. If you're carrying a book, spend two stress. If you have a rune, spend two stress. If you have a yellow mark on you, spend two stress. And if you don't, you start taking wounds or going insane. Um, without maintaining your stress level, your entire group is going to end up terrified. And when you're terrified, that just quickly drives you insane. And your, your group's going to be out. And this is exactly what happened the first time we played the scenario. Like, it was not a long game. That's interesting because I, I, I specifically remember my character uh, had a linkage between, when I played, had a linkage between stress and wounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and it never really came up. I wasn't really understanding why they had gone with this, uh, this function or maybe, I guess they actually, maybe that was my, um, You're my psychosis at the time, at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe that's, maybe that's what it was, but yeah. And I, and I didn't understand why they would even include this because it just didn't seem valid. Well, obviously yeah. it's more valid in some scenarios oh, yeah. than others. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, so lessons learned, like this was a quick enough game that we started a second one. Pretty quickly thereafter, we just kept everything set up. We did swap out players again. Uh, the went much better the second time. Uh, we actually did manage to stop the ritual. But once Cthulhu was on the board, so one of the things Cthulhu does once he's on the board is everyone starts losing sanity every turn. That combined with the amount of sanity we were losing because of not having the stress, like it was, it was much tighter than the first game. Uh, we did get him down to his final form, but like we had done like one damage to him at that point. Like I would say it's close, but not that close. Uh, this was definitely way more tense than scenario one, uh, which wasn't a bad thing. It was that co-op tension where you come so close, you just want to play again. It's what I use makes Pandemic such a good game because Pandemic, in my opinion, is actually more fun to lose. If you win your first game of Pandemic, you're not going to get Pandemic. You need to lose and be close and want to play again and, and lose and be close and play again, and then finally get it. You want that release. And that's what I can see in this scenario, too. And everyone was like, oh, I want to try again. But the store was closing. So we never got to play that final game. All right. <clears throat> so uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Well, right now it's all Black Friday sales. Follow at tabletop underscore deals at maple game deals for Canadian deals. We are all about the sales. We, this show survives through affiliate sales as well as help of our patrons that is what we're going to be focusing on uh, i actually don't even know if i'll get into any gaming for this coming week because there's a lot going on my monday night group on monday cyber monday Mo cyber monday could be as big as black friday it's, it's gonna be a mess and just the timing of things because there were five saturdays in this month and i tend to do stuff on the second third and fourth saturdays it's actually going to be a while before our next local gaming event. But if you are local and you are listening, we will be back at the CG Realm on December the 14th. At this point, I have no idea if there's going to be a theme or a specific game highlighted. But everyone is always welcome to come out 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. and play some games. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly from the excellent Gaming and BS podcast. Thanks, Sean. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. So not this month. So I think they're back next Tuesday, so I think we're good at this point. Ah, okay. They did take November off. They did not record last night. And last, a big welcome to our latest patron, Blood Boiler. 
A name I recognize from our Twitch chat room. Thanks for your support. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock through those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Uh, drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatcher and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday morning. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite after the show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.